Sri Aurobindo explains this in a different language elsewhere. Impersonality is the divine asserting its freedom from all relations. Personality is the same divine playing with and enjoying the relations. But it's still one, the same oneness. Next he says, it finds the same oneness in Nirguna and Saguna, capital. So, for those who are not familiar with the vocabulary of Sanskrit, Guna is quality. Nir, negation, no quality. Sa is affirmation with quality. Nirguna and Saguna. But why does Sri Aurobindo bother to use these technical terms? Because there are, there's something very important implied. There's a whole um, philosophy and line of experience richly developed behind both of these words. Guna is not just quality. The association of the word goes back to something very deep in the yogic uh, philosophy and development when in exploring the nature of the world the yogis tried to see what is it, is, what is it that causes things? What makes for this to be white or for that to be brown? What makes for their inherent existence even? And going deep into things, pursuing all the way to a depth which is extremely difficult for us to recognize, to even experience, they found that ultimately everything resolves itself into some essential fundamental qualities. Now here when we look at the world, there's innumerable, infinite range of qualities. But if you go back down, a few create all this. Now the same idea is existing in modern science where all these are different materials. But if you break them down, you find certain molecules common. But if you break those down, there are only a finite type of atoms. You have the table of elements approaching some 90 plus, they become more and more unstable. But broadly, our normal experience of the universe is covered in the first 80 or so elements. Everything resolves itself down to 80 types of atoms. But if you go a little deeper even within those elements, everything resolves itself into three particles. Electron, proton, neutron. Out of these three, the whole universe is constructed. Interesting, isn't it? And so the same way when you approach the thing, go deeper in consciousness terms, and this was the approach of the yogi, yogis, they said the form of the electron, proton, neutron also is not the thing. What makes electron, electron, or proton, proton, or neutron, neutron? There's something more essential behind. And they saw things from a different angle. They said form is secondary. The quality expressed is primary. Now get science is coming back very indirectly to this perception, but not yet facing the truth of it. When you try to describe an electron, in the physics of it. Two electrons can never meet. They can never touch each other. Why? Because by the time they come close enough, the field between them is so intense that there's no force in the universe which can force them to join. The field actually becomes infinite at the point of contact. So you can never bring two together. That means you, you can never see an electron because no particle can actually touch it. Any particle which approaches is either repelled or attracted, but can never actually touch. And so what is an electron like? Can you even image it? Mathematically, we cannot. We try to conceive of it with mathematics. The problem with an electron conceived like a, you know, they picture it like a ball in your textbooks. The problem with that is the surface of the ball itself being made of a surface the force of the electric charge would be so great the ball would explode. And yet there seems to be some kind of a finite distance beyond which you cannot approach. There is as if an outline which you experience. What is inside it, we cannot describe. What is the surface made of, we cannot know. In fact, it, it puts physics into a huge tailspin to just question what is an electron. So they just avoid the question. 
Occasionally you have books which are compilations of articles on what is an electron. All of them are speculative. So the yogis went deeper. They said, what makes electron electron is not the shape or the form. It's the quality it radiates. It is the quality radiating which gives you the impression of a shape. You see, if you look at the flower, how do you know this flower for what it is? If you couldn't see, the perfume. The perfume would tell you, ah, it is this. But when you see, what are you seeing? You're not seeing flower. You're seeing the light reflected from it. That's all you can know. And why did the light reflecting from it acquire this particular color or pattern? Because of the way this flower radiated qualities that modified the light touching. The light came, the quality of the flower modified its reflection, which gives you the image of a flower. Actually, there is no such thing. There is only a bundle of qualities. Now, this is a much deeper perspective than of current science, which looks at form and quality as a result of form. The ancients saw quality first, form as a result of quality. And the advantage of this approach is everything resolves itself to quality of consciousness. There is one notion of consciousness throwing out in its movements variations of qualities. Where the quality is neutral, you say there is nothing because your hand can go right through. Where the quality is strong, you say, ah, there is some resistance. I cannot go through. You see? But it's the same motion all through, changing qualities only. This is the perspective in which the word guna comes in. Going down to the innumerable variety of qualities, they found all qualities resolve themselves to three particular qualities. Tamas, Rajas and Sattva. When something comes to me, I as a piece of consciousness in this ocean, let's say, when something comes to me, I can offer only three responses. Inertia, resisting, or active response, I get pushed back, I give a push back, a knock, or harmonizing balance. Tamas, Rajas and Sattva. All consciousness puts out a combination of these three. So let's look at flower again. The ray of light that comes upon it, the consciousness here is putting a pattern of qualities, resisting some of the light, modifying the rest of the light, and then adapting to some of it. That triple combination makes for this particular color of the flower. The same triple combination differently combined makes for a different color. When my finger pushes, it is the electrical field of the atoms on my fingertip meeting the electrical field on the atoms of the flower, meaning I never touch an object. Field meeting field, quality meeting quality. The bundle of qualities emerging from the flower meet the bundle of qualities from my fingertip Consciousness meeting consciousness and quality of response meeting quality of response gives me the illusion this is soft, that is hard. This is empty air, this is a rigid table of wood. In fact, there is only one ocean of consciousness playing with different qualities and all qualities resolve to combinations of these three. Now this idea is very profound. It goes to the very basis of what we would call the yogic science. It explains matter in ways that opens up a whole new possibility of science, including the power of transmutation. Once you approach science from this basis, you can take this wood from the table, modify the pattern of qualities, and it would become gold. You see? Or it would dematerialize because it would cease to interact to your light. Your light would pass right through. You say, ah, it doesn't exist anymore. Oh no, it exists in a different poise of consciousness and relationship. Or rematerialize or make it soft by playing with qualities. Do anything to modify, transmute materials. This is the future science which we will come to hopefully very soon. But 
So behind this is this knowledge of the gunas. Okay? So when you say saguna and nirguna, now I look at the divine as this bursting bundle of infinite qualities, playing, modifying only qualities of consciousness, of its delight, of awareness. Or the divine standing back from all qualities, impersonal, massive, behind everything, and the play of quality is only some superficial play or none at all. And these are two approaches to the divine. You can approach the divine as the source of all these things. Literally the manifestation is his body playing out these qualities. Or you can approach the divine as transcending all qualities and therefore without quality and manifestation separate from him somehow like a dream or illusion or some separate creation. So these are two approaches to the divine in practice and each one of us has a natural inclination for one of these. There are those who say, I want to know the divine with this form, with this love, with this sweetness, with this joy or whatever it is or this power or knowledge. You want that quality, for you that quality defines the divine. And there are others who will say, no, for me the divine is that which transcends all this. And it's a difference of temperament. But for, from within the experience of the divine, pouring quality or standing back free of all the pouring of qualities, it is the same one. And so the integral knowledge finds the same oneness in nirguna without quality and in saguna infinite quality the same poise the same oneness the same consciousness the same satchidananda you see why Sri Aurobindo takes pains to use these words because they give a very different view of the universe and of the divine and the relation of the divine with the universe and then it finds the same oneness in the infinite depths of the universal silence and the infinite largeness of the universal action. These are again two extreme poises. And the suggestion here is both are infinite. When you enter into the silence, how deep can you go? Infinite silence is there a point where you say, ah, the silence stops? There can be nothing more silent than this. Doesn't make sense, right? So you can go on and on and on unendingly into the depth of silence. But equally on the other side, when you move out into the largeness of the action, pouring energy, bursting, moving, is there some poise where you can say, ah, now it reaches a limit? The moment you put a limit, you can conceive of something beyond, but you can conceive of it because it's already there. It means it's already formed. It exists, right? So there is an infinite largeness in the movement. Infinite silence, infinite movement. In both extremes, it is the same one infinite. It is the same one consciousness, one being, one delight. So I read the whole sentence now, and you see in four giant strokes Sri Aurobindo sweeps the whole expanse of reality and unifies these extremes, opposites so the integral knowledge makes no such division it arrives at a different kind of absoluteness in its vision of the unity it finds the same oneness in the unmanifest and the manifest in the impersonal and the personal, in nirguna and saguna, in the infinite depths of the universal silence and the infinite largeness of the universal action. The same oneness. And then he takes in the next sentence, now in the next sentence it looks at, these four broad strokes are looking at the whole of reality. Once you enter into the manifestation, within that also there are opposites and extremes. And these now he lists in the next sentence. 
it finds the same absolute oneness in the purusha and the prakriti the witnessing poise and the movement of energy in the divine presence and the works of the divine power and knowledge in the eternal manifestation of the one purusha and the constant manifestation of manifestations of the many purushas in the inalienable unity of sachidananda keeping constantly real to itself its own manifold oneness and in the apparent divisions of mind life and body in which oneness is constantly if secretly real and constantly seeks to be realized it's a bit long sentence but again in broad strokes inside manifestation he takes these extremes so what's happening you will see in these two sentences he unifies all reality all creation and underlying everything is the same sachidananda and oneness by resolving everything back into sachidananda you discover this oneness equally present in all the extremes so let's explore these extremes now inside manifestation what happens when you look at the way the world is made you'll find there are always necessary two positions one cannot exist without the other and the other is incomplete without the one the picture the analogy we will take is that of a painting and i've used this analogy many times before as an artist you take paint and you draw on the canvas now what if the canvas moved with your brush what would happen there would be no painting the canvas has to stay still so that your brush can move against it if there was not something which is static you could not have movement as a concept even isn't it all movement implies something which is static even if i sweep my arm in empty space in our mind there is a fixed empty space into which my arm moves isn't it and you cannot avoid this both exist in relativity though the surface of the earth is right now moving at i think what 18 kilometers per second we are moving at 18 kilometers per second in which my arm moves up and down has it really moved up and down no from the perspective of space it has moved in waves across 18 kilometers but in that perspective of space again there is implied something which is static against which the earth is moving and my arm and the earth are moving you take one step outside it and look at the picture from outside the solar system the entire solar system is moving towards a particular galaxy far away and at a humongous speed so the earth moving around the sun is not like this it's actually a spiral but again this picture assumes a static space from my perspective you see the whole thing is very relative you can take any position from anywhere you could take some kind of an absolute position i stand out from the universe that would still be relative but let's assume something really really big and then you can see of some kind of a static underlying thing against which the universe moves always there has to be something static otherwise you cannot have movement and this poise which is static which allows for movement is the purusha but if you had only the static and no movement well what would you have an empty universe the canvas is blank and in the relationship the more static the more rigid the canvas the more freely the stroke can play the more rich the colors and the power of the play so this static poise of purusha must be absolute or as absolute as possible for the play to be as rich and diverse and intense and absolutely free as possible okay so there is everywhere this double poise in any activity there is some reference against which the activity has to take can take place so when we look at purusha and prakriti they are a duality both dependent and bound to each other 
Purusha implies possibility of movement, even if the movement is not expressed, it's implied. Movement presumes something static against which movement exists. You cannot separate the two. Each carries the other with it. And yet they are extreme in their opposition. What this is, that is not. There is no static in the movement. What that is, this is not. There is no movement in the static. And yet they are bound, somehow, inseparably. And so in this opposition, in the way the universe is formed, there are these two extremes fundamental to each other. It, the integral knowledge, finds the same absolute oneness in the Purusha and the Prakriti. So this is the first of the four. Next, in the divine presence and the works of the divine power and knowledge. Now you'll see in the sequence, as in the previous four sequence, there's a development. Once you've caught the Purusha Prakriti relation, you see how the divine power, presence, consciousness takes also this double poise. First there is the divine presence, as if supporting, containing, providing the canvas, the foundation on which the power and knowledge of the presence can flow and play. So presence, static, and the power and the knowledge, active. But they are both aspects of the same divine. And in both these, equally, you find the same oneness. Third, in the eternal manifestation of the one Purusha, and the constant manifestation of the many Purushas. And it's taking the same idea now and spreading it around in scale. The Purusha Prakriti, we saw on its cosmic level, now within the cosmos, everything that is put out is same one being, remember? And therefore in everything that is put out, the same being is present both as Purusha and Prakriti take an analogy again here of my body and I. I am in my consciousness observing Purusha, in my consciousness identified in action Prakriti. But in my consciousness observing action, I am observing my hand do, I observe in my hand the Purusha poise from which the fingers move. It is the reference against which the fingers have to play. Inside the fingertip, again a poise of Purusha, taking its reference against which it does its action. Because it is the same one consciousness pouring out, it is present everywhere. And in each of its presences, it is entirely whole and can burst out freely, unendingly, with the same creative power as the origin. This idea is pictured in the modern scientific vocabulary as the hologram. That is, the whole is represented in the part, or the part captures the whole, but in an aspect, but it is still the whole. And represented in form in this modern uh, vocabulary of science, which is called the fractal. Uh, the fractal is a design in which the overall pattern of the whole is repeated in the part, and with variations, which makes for a very rich variety, but what is interesting in the fractal is, you can take this picture, you must have all seen fractal images, you zoom in on a part, and the part is similar to the big picture. And then you zoom in on another part of it, and you discover that part is similar, different, but similar to the original picture. And you can go on zooming unendingly, take any tiny part, and you zoom until it becomes similar to the whole picture. It's interesting. This is the way the universe in fact is formed. The same one divine pouring out, remember, unendingly plays with unending possibilities of unending relations in unending time. All being rich colors of its delight. And so everything holds in itself potentially unending possibilities. Now in most things that potential is sleeping deliberately. If everything was bursting out unendingly, well, you would have, it's as if all of Shakespeare's played playing simultaneously and all the movies of the world simultaneously put on the screen, it would make a big mess. 
you wouldn't enjoy anything. So for the purpose of the play, certain things are withheld while other things are first bursting out. Each center thus bursting out becomes the potential for another bursting out. So each one of us individuals as a conscious soul is a part and expression of that but the whole of that putting a front, a special limited front. And in each one of us therefore eventually there is the possibility of the full divine revelation in a different way, like the fractal. There's an interesting tradition among a particular group in America, in the United States of America, I believe 150 years ago, I forget the name, if anybody remembers the group, perhaps it's the Mormons, but I'm not sure. They have this belief that they hold family to be very important and they have this belief that in the afterlife each one of them will be a given a planet to look after. You see the seed idea is this, that as you complete your evolution and the journey of your evolution, you preside over the whole new birth of another multiplicity as if. It's obviously something which was glimpsed by the founder of that tradition saw a possibility, articulated it in terms which his mind could contain. But the truth of it is this, within each one of us there is this unending potential. But it doesn't have to take that form. As we awaken in our consciousness and find, live in this oneness, we become participants in the creative process. And through each one of us it can flow out equally as it flows out in the origin. But in the conscious awakened individual, the capacity to express is much greater and the freedom of that expression is more spontaneous. In the flower, there is a limited capacity to express and the freedom is limited. That's the only difference. But if you think about it more deeply, it's by choice. It is the same, same one being who says, in this poise I will remain flower and not go much more. I will play with the possibilities of flower, but not become elephant. That would be pointless. To hold poise of flower and all the varieties of flower experience is the free intention here. But in the human being it says, ah, in this I will try to play with my freedom and develop all possible experiences and their variations. And so these are consciously chosen poises of the same one being. So here, there, is, there are many purushas, many poises, centers of consciousness awakening, but they are all essentially the same one purusha taking up specialized poises. We may again play with an analogy here. If you take a source of light, you put a screen in front which conceals the light, that's the inconscient. Then you punch holes in the screen. Through each hole, a beam of light will come out, which is unique. No two beams will ever meet. It is unique. Each one is different, and yet they are all the same light, differently expressed, different in their partiality, different in their direction, different in their purpose. And so he says, it will find the same oneness in the eternal, in the eternal man manifestness of the one Purusha and the constant manifestation of the many Purushas. This one Purusha never changes. All the unending other Purushas keep growing, new ones coming into play, new rays, new holes in the screen, each one of them growing differently, uniquely. And at the same time there is one Purusha who is ever manifest, always one. In these two extremes, which the mind would have separated as one greater and one lesser, the integral knowledge finds the same oneness. And finally, in this fourth image, there's an extraordinary uh, picture he gives us, bringing back to the Satchidananda at the foundation. It finds the same oneness in the inalienable unity of Satchidananda keeping constantly real to itself its own manifold oneness 
this is one side and on the other side and the apparent divisions of mind life body in which oneness is constantly if secretly real and constantly seeks to be realized so here are two extremes of sachidananda in which also it finds oneness so let's look at these two and you'll see how this is the ultimate reconciliation the ultimate resolution which unifies everything else first is the inalienable unity of sachidananda keeping constantly real to itself its own manifold oneness sachidananda is one one being one consciousness one bliss this unity is inalienable nothing at all can compromise this why because there is nothing other than this one consciousness which is bliss there is nothing else so what can compromise this is simply utterly freely so in alienable in alienable unity of sachidananda but this in alienable unity is doing something keeping constantly real to itself its own manifold oneness it is concentrating on its oneness but the oneness is not a monotone it is manifold all these infinite possibilities and aspects as it dwells upon them like the creator of the play shakespeare dwelling upon all the infinite possibilities of what he can express what he can be and all the characters and all the lives and the sachidananda dwells upon this infinite manifold oneness manifold has this particular idea not just many but a complexity of many in which each of the many can further multiply unendingly the same oneness represented in each of the many the holographic idea or the fractal fractal concept each thing put out holds infinitely unending possibility so the idea of a manifold is this many folded into each other so to say in the oneness so this sachidananda's in alien in alienable unity is dwelling on its manifold oneness keeping constantly real to itself its oneness even as it dwells on its multiplicity within it okay this is one side and what's the other extreme where you invert this you put your whole consciousness on the multiplicity and look back at the unity behind okay here the unity is dominant looking into the multiplicity within itself and now you invert the picture what's at the other extreme in the apparent divisions of mind life and body yes they are divided but they only appear divided in which oneness is constantly if secretly real and constantly seeks to be realized so the oneness is there hidden secret two things it's doing first it is always real you can never say there is no oneness here because it's all taking place in the same one sachidananda made of its substance made of its consciousness and bliss so but it's secret because it's hidden how does it hide by creating layers of the manifold one delight of itself and another delight of itself are put as if against each other one concealing the other and this concealment is used to conceal something else and that concealment is used to conceal something else by dwelling in consciousness on these different as if layers the sachidananda creates this appearance of many layers of concealment so the oneness is there constantly and always real but secretly but because it is secretly there it can also try to reveal itself if there was not first the secrecy of the hiding there could not be subsequently the movement of revealing so both things are happening it is constantly real but secretly and constantly seeks to be realized to become revealed in its reality so let's take the picture of the creator shakespeare again 
He has created a narration, a story. This is a mystery story. So in his own consciousness, he has to hide the answer of the mystery. From whom? From himself. In the storyline, it's obvious the characters don't know what's the secret behind this event. So typically these are, somebody has committed a crime. We don't know who it is. But somebody knows in the story, at least the person who did it knows, right? In more complex stories, even the person who did it does not know. But somebody knows who made him do it. But all the time in the consciousness of the writer, it's known. And yet he has to hide from himself, as if he does not know, he has to become this part of the detective who's looking for the answer. And if you see, in typically in the modern novels, we are not happy with a simple solution. There is something very interesting happening. If you look back at the evolution of novels, of mystery novels of the last hundred years or two hundred years, you will find they are growing in complexity. There was a time when you had a simple solution. The old movies, they had a simple solution. You watch those old movies and you say, ah, boring, I could have guessed it. But you see what happened when enough of those movies came and people got used to the idea of a simple solution, they had to create complex movies where there was a double hidden layer. You thought it is this, but in fact it was something else and you're surprised, right? And once you got used to that, mm, you're anticipating that the director is going to hide in two layers. So you have to create a third layer of complexity. See where it goes? Eventually, as you grow in your capacity, in your capacity to anticipate how the director is thinking, you have to add another layer and another layer. So today's directors have to create surprises, have to deceive you in many complex ways, make you think it's this, and then make you think you've now gone beyond it to the next and gone beyond it to the third, Meanwhile, the fourth is lying hidden behind, which you could not even imagine. This is what you will see in some of the movies of Manoj Knight Shyamalan. M. Shyamalan is how he, he writes his name. Uh, one of those was The Sixth Sense, was one of them. And then there was another where there was a village. I don't remember the name of the movie. But suddenly the scene changes in a way, oh wow, you just got thrown around in space and time. You thought it was this period, it's a different period. You thought it was this location, it's a totally different location. And your whole perspective now suddenly gets reversed. And often in such stories or movies, you will go back to review. Now from the new perspective. Something you could not have imagined was thrown as a surprise at the end. You must go back and re-see this. Now imagine the complexity involved in the narrator of the story. He has in himself, in his own consciousness, to convince himself of the truth of this view. And then layer each of these truths, knowing, being fully convinced in each, and yet hold overall the consistency across them. That as you unfold through these three layers, you cannot go back and say, yeah, but then this does not fit that piece. It has all to fit, it has all to make logical sense, and yet these triple or quadruple layer of surprise should be there. Isn't it difficult? In his own mind he has to split himself into these extreme poises and be convinced of each of them and yet make a narration. And this is what's happening in the Sachidananda. Dwelling upon this except infinitely, all viewpoints and all layers of concealment infinitely and when the infinite layers of concealment go all through to the end, the last poise is utter loss of consciousness, loss of delight, loss of existence, apparently. That makes for your appearance of dead matter. And the emergence from there gradually of the now hidden consciousness and hidden bliss and hidden existence pushing forward poking a little leaf, pushing out of the earth, revealing a little more and a little more until it grows to become the full potential that it was now concealed. 
the whole evolutionary process is possible because of the first concealment in which Satchidananda has to experience to itself really the loss of itself, of its own reality. You see the internal contradiction as it seems to the mind. But to the Satchidananda itself it is an effortless movement of pretending to conceal when all the time it's fully aware of what it is concealing. These two poises of being bound in the concealment and being in the awareness of what is concealed, these are the two extremes. If you reconcile these two, you have reconciled everything. And this is what he is showing you. The first poise is Satchidananda keeping constantly real to itself its own manifold oneness. Meaning it's conscious of all the layers of concealment. They are all revealed to it. Nothing is hidden. And on the other side, the apparent divisions of mind, life and body in which oneness is constantly, if secretly, real and constantly seeks to be realized. Although it's real, apparently concealed, it now needs to realize because it has to break out of this concealment. And this is what makes for this rich expression of the universe. We are looking at the Satchidananda from two angles, from within its unity looking at multiplicity, from within the multiplicity looking at unity, everywhere it is the same oneness. And this is the integral knowledge. And now he summarizes this. All unity is to it the integral knowledge. An intense, pure and infinite realization. All difference, an abundant, rich and boundless realization of the same divine and eternal being. So in summarizing the oneness experience, he uses two words, unity and difference. Both of these are poises of the divine consciousness, of the Satchidananda in the play. What is the difference between the two? How does Satchidananda see oneness? How does Satchidananda see unity? And how does Satchidananda see difference? Because after all, the experience of difference is taking place inside Satchidananda. So first, unity and difference. What is, let's first look at the, what they mean. What is unity? When two things join and become one. What is difference? When the same two things separate out. You cannot speak of unity unless there are two things to unite. You cannot speak of difference unless there are two things to be different about. Right? So, it's basically relationships between two aspects of Satchidananda. The relationship of joining, the relationship of playing in separateness. And he's now describing these two. All unity is to it an intense, pure and infinite realization. So, in the Satchidananda, when these two things join, there is an intensity. There is a purity and there is an infinity because both things are really aspects of the Satchinanda which is infinite. When they join it is infinity meeting infinity. Pure because there is no veil, no separation. They are just revealed to each other entirely. And intense because it is two aspects of its own bliss joining. Now this word pure, let's look at what that means. What did it mean to have a veil? Satchidananda choosing to emphasize, hide one from the other. That is the impurity, so to say. I pretend to myself that I didn't make a mistake. How dare you criticize me? I didn't make a mistake. It was his fault. He deserved it. What am I doing? I am hiding from myself what I already know. I create an apparent separation. Now, in the context of the human being, it is self-deception. In the context of the Satchidananda, which is utterly aware, it's even aware of what it is doing, it is not a self-deception, it's a play. It's a pretense. But in the play, there is this 
which is the play of separateness. And when you remove that, there is the purity, this is what I always was. Okay? So intense, pure and infinite realization. The nature of this we can glimpse in when you think of it this way. When you live in the Satchidananda consciousness and recognize the flower as Satchidananda consciousness, the perfume you breathe is infinity meeting infinity. Bliss of infinite meeting bliss of infinite in two different aspects. And what's the nature of that meeting? Infinite bliss. Every experience of life is an aspect of the infinite bliss. And when there is this meeting, there is this joining, there is this unity, it is intense, pure, infinite realization of itself, of Satchidananda. What is it to be different, to separate? All difference is an abundant, rich and boundless realization of the same divine and eternal being. So what's happening here when you separate? Abundant. There is and then it is not a limitation. There is an ending possibility here. In the fact of separating two things, wow, we can now do so many different relations, so many different forms, so many different possibilities of the play. Rich. Each of these is simultaneously yearning to express itself. There are so many pulls and pushes of the expression of the delight. Boundless, no limits, even in this. What? Realization of the same divine and eternal being playing this way or playing that way. So Mother describes this idea in a different phrasing when she speaks of the two kinds of bliss of the Satchidananda. She speaks of the bliss of identity and the bliss of union. The Satchidananda dwelling upon himself in all its infinite possibilities is blissful in its dwelling in its identity because it is already all that it can conceive itself to be. It's one. There's a, that's one bliss. And then there is the bliss of union that is an aspect, a part, separates out as if and then from separation rejoins to unite. And she says, this bliss of union is a far greater bliss because it's more rich, more complex, with greater possibilities in the play. Not only in the movement of the separation, but in the movement of coming together, there's a greater richness of possibilities. It is this which he's speaking of, all difference and abundant, rich and boundless realization. And Mother says, it is for this reason that the universe was created. So that the divine may as if separate from itself to become all that it is not, as if, and then from there awaken to rejoin and reunite with all that it always was and is secretly now expressed. But in this movement of the coming together, there's this extremely rich play of the delight. Initially, the delight is concealed. So what you experience is pain and struggle and perhaps suffering. But as you awaken and the delight emerges, the consciousness grows. It reveals itself to be secretly delight preparing. And then there is the revealed delight, which is the greater part of the play in the bliss of union. But it is the same divine and eternal being always. So this last sentence we reread and you see what he captures in it. All unity is to the integral knowledge an intense, pure and infinite realization. All difference, an abundant, rich and boundless realization of the same divine and eternal being. And this summarizes the experience of this self-knowledge in the Satchidananda, of which Sri Aurobindo says then in the next paragraph, the complete realization of unity is therefore the essence of the integral knowledge and of the integral yoga. This kind of completeness of the unity, 
this living in this oneness is the essence of the integral knowledge and the integral yoga it's the essence it's not the whole of it out of this so much will emerge but if this is not there the rest cannot be and so it's the essence of the integral yoga to know sachidananda one in himself and one in all his manifestation is the basis of the knowledge to make that vision of oneness real to the consciousness to become that by merging the sense of separate individuality in the sense of unity with all beings is its effectuation in the yoga of knowledge to live think feel will and act in that sense of unity is its effectuation in the individual being and the individual life three things he is speaking of knowledge the yoga of knowledge and the individual life and three degrees in which this realization flows to become effective in living thinking feeling willing and action this realization of oneness and this practice of oneness indifference is the whole of the yoga what a perspective everything is held now in this this realization of oneness and this practice of oneness and difference which is what we are doing in life is the whole of the yoga the whole of the yoga so this paragraph which i have just quickly read through now which looks at the what this oneness means in practice how do you apply it how does it work out in the life and in the journey that he has summarized in this paragraph we will see next time because it needs some exploration to fully appreciate all the nuances but the overall sense of what the oneness is in which one has to live is what we hold for now we can pause here and uh, look at any questions or comments a couple of a couple of people came to mind um from history one is helen keller mm -hmm. who was cut off from <laughs> most normal ways of communicating mm -hmm. and how she became very expressive mm -hmm. and able to communicate and then um of course stephen hawking which he was able to flower mm -hmm. flower into another mm -hmm. expression mm -hmm. you know so mm. i guess never somehow mm. give up is the only thing that yes. comes to mind yes it's an interesting way of looking at it all of us are helen keller or stephen hawking to different degrees that's the whole journey of awakening Helen Keller for those who may not know she was deaf dumb and blind right all three together oh, she could speak oh, she could speak okay or maybe partially i had the impression all three but anyway major limitation if you cannot hear or see you have only touch and if you cannot speak or speak only partially how do you communicate normally you would say ah such a person would just have a very simple basic uh, vegetating life but here was a rich life in which she actually changed the lives of many in in the thousands and served in a way that was extraordinary the only way you can explain this is if you recognize that within us in the essence of our consciousness we already have all that but limited only by our senses and the limitation of the biology but we have everything which is needed all that is meant to unfold and flower out is held already and if these things are suffocating and blocking the revelation of what is held that is strong enough to work through and even bypass those limitations and that is extraordinary in the human being for most of us because we can see and hear and speak and pretty much function normally we think this is all we can do this is all that we are no there is in fact a much greater potential which we see push forward in these unusual cases where everything was blocked up but in us when everything is not blocked up we should be able to do so much more <laughs>
if she could live a completely normal human life and even an extraordinary human life with all those limitations, we should be able to go so much more. It's just that we do not even conceive of that possibility and do not even make the effort to go into that. And this is what the mother tried to provoke among those who were around her. And some once at one point, she, in disappointment, she said to the children, I'm disappointed that you do not even question, you do not even want to do so much more. When I was your age, and she says at the age of 18, I had already had the realization of the inner divine and was moving on for what more. And I could not contain myself the moment I realized it's possible, I had to do it, she said. And you people, you're given everything and you don't want to try even. So if we look into ourselves, what is it that prevents us? It's a kind of a dullness and a numbness which not only cannot see or refuses to see rather, but does not want to make the effort. But if the push is strong or if we make the effort, what we can do is infinitely greater. And really the gradual unfolding of that is our journey of evolution. <laughs> and sometimes it needs the external block to force us to want to make that extra effort. And that's what you see in both of these examples which you have mentioned. We can hold this sense of oneness which he has led us into and it is useful to dwell on it as a form of meditation. So one way is you could read this passage, dwell upon the sense of each of these words and phrases the way we have done now or you could just hold the overall imprint and remain suffused in it and if possible take it to the next level by remember the line we read from the next paragraph to live, think, feel, will and act in that sense of unity is its effectuation in the individual being and the individual life. It is towards this that we have to move. So remaining immersed in it, we then extend it into some activity, some movement, and let it more and more suffuse into your life. Start with the times when it's easiest. You are walking, you can put yourself in that mood. Maybe not in the midst of work, but when you're moving towards your work. When you sit down before you start your work, align yourself to this. Whenever you have an occasion where it's easier, dwell upon the sense of this underlying oneness. And then gradually it will creep into the rest of the activities and begin to suffuse it. But we will see more of that next time, which we will take up next Friday. We can end with a chant of Om together. Oh.